Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone, depending on where you're located. So, and welcome back to Symmetries in Newcastle. Our first speaker of the day is Gabriel Verret from University of Auckland in New Zealand, and his talk will be in about local actions in vertex transitive graphs. Great, thank you. Um, it's my first time giving a research talk on Zoom, actually, so I hope it goes all right. But uh, let me know if there's anything. Uh, I won't have the chat open, so just interrupt me if you have a question. Uh, I think it should be fine. Is that okay as a, as a process, Michael? Or unless you I want to type it in chat and then Michael can, can ask the question or something. Yeah, I have the chat open and I'm looking at it, so if okay. necessary, I will read what is in there. All right, perfect, thanks. Okay, so yeah, as you said, the talk is about local actions in vertex transitive graphs, and it's more or less divided into two big halves. The first half will be actually about graphs, um, and it'll be, I don't want to say it's a finished story, but it'll be stuff that we know a little bit more about. And the second half will be about trying to extend this to digraphs, directed graphs. And that part is a lot more, I don't want to say like experimental, but sort of uh, at least under under construction or under pro progress. So it's still work in progress. And there's way more stuff we don't know in that case. But so let me get started. Um, so I say here, everything will be finite. That's not completely true, especially given the audience. I've tried to uh, make some concessions and I'll, I'll try to mention a few places where um, what happens in the sort of the infinite case, but there's actually a lot of connections in the infinite case and a lot of the stuff can actually um, be done in the infinite case. But if I don't specify, uh, everything is fine. And then the graphs will be connected and simple, uh, at least for the first half. So no directions, no loops, no multiple edges. So sort of very basic objects. And here are sort of all the basic definitions. So maybe the first one that people might not be familiar with is an arc in graph. That's just an ordered pair of adjacent vertices. So it's almost like an edge, but the order matters, right? So you, two vert you have two vertices and they're adjacent, but you, the order matters. Um, and then what is vertex transitive? Well, we look at subgroups of the automorphism group G, and we'll say the graph is G vertex transitive if this acts transitively on the vertices, or G arc transitive if it's transitive on the arcs. And very, if we don't really care about the, the specified the groups, then we just say vertex transitive or arc transitive or if we can pick the group to be the whole of course. All right. Okay, and now let me start with sort of the most basic in the sense that it's by far the oldest result in this area. In fact, there's almost no other important results in this area for a few decades. Um, but it's not basic. I mean, it's still a very important and useful result. This is due to Tut. Um, and this is the result. If you have a three valent, say, GR transitive graph, then the order of the stabilizer, so this is my notation for the stabilizer, G sub V, is at most 48. And so it's bounded by constant. It, it cannot be too big. Um, and this has many, many implications. Let's start with sort of the more obvious one. So if you're in the finite case, uh, then you can apply the orbit stabilizer and you get you know, the order of the group because everything is transitive. The order of the group is the number of vertices times the size of the stabilizer. In particular, um, the order of the group is sort of linear in the number of vertices. So it's not too big, it's sort of smallish. And that's the best we could expect, right? By transitivity, the size of the group should be at least um, roughly the number of vertices. So it's as, as good as possible. Actually, let me make a comment right now, since I said I'll try to comment what happens in the infinite case. Um, not only this result, but in fact, Tut's original proof, if you read it a bit carefully, it actually applies in the infinite case, as long as you assume that the vertex stabilizer is finite, or like you have a sort of discrete which will be sort of the theme for most of the result, but even more so. If you look at the proof very carefully and just sort of more or less keep the same proof, you can actually prove that it applies to any graph, any three-valent graph, including infinite, except the infinite tree. And it's an easy exercise. And actually, some of you might not have thought about this before. I think there's some of you that probably know this result and know this here, but I've never thought about this. But it's an easy exercise to, des to de deduce this as a corollary. So it's quite a general result in the sense. So it applies to the infinite tree as well, as long as you assume that you have a group finite stabilizer, but in fact it applies to every single other graph without any restriction, except the infinite tree and some of its uh, sub. It's quite a general result. And it has so many applications. Like I've started so many talks with this theorem because so many different theorems sort of uh, are inspired by it, but even directly applications. So let me start with sort of one of the most obvious ones. Um, I don't want to get too much into details, but you can use such a result because it's basically bounding the order of the group. You can use this to enumerate these graphs up to a relatively large order. So for example, Marcin Condor, who's the expert on this, 
uh, has a list on his website of all the cubic arc tensor graphs up to order 10,000. And I don't want to go too much into detail of how he does this, but suffice to say that it depends heavily on the fact that the stabilizer is involved. Because the stabilizer is sort of small size, he can do this because the group is not this, too, too big. But basically he does, because some of you are interested in, in, in trees and so on, what he does is actually he does work in the tree. Basically, this tells you that there's only a few subgroups to look at in the tree. And then basically he looks at finite quotients uh, of bounded index of, of these groups acting on the tree. So in a sense, everything is sort of happening uh, in the infinite cubic tree. So that's one example in an application. Graphs of small order. I mean, largest, but small order. You can actually do go at the other extreme as well. Um, using this result, it's not very hard to deduce using results from Silubotsky about uh, uh, subgroup growth in finitely presented groups, that you can bound then the number, the asymptotic number of such graphs. So roughly speaking, this family of graphs, there's roughly n to the log n uh, such graph. So, so we can do the, the sort of small case enumeration, and we can also do the large scale enumeration. And you know, the answer turns out to be roughly n log n. But again, this is the reason we can do this is because of this result by time. So this, you, and this is another example. And I could go on and on. Um, I'll, I'll give two more examples. They're not actually, the last two examples I listed, Simpson conjecture and Goldsmith's AMAGA method, they're not actually application of the result, they're actually application of the proof. So Charles Sims actually read um, Tut's proof and said, oh, actually, this proof is very interesting. If you apply the method, you can do this and this. And he used it to prove some result about primitive groups of subdegree three. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. And then eventually led to his conjecture and so on and so on. And similarly, Goldschmidt read the proof and was like, oh, okay. And then um, he looked at sort of the ad transitive case, which is equivalent. And, and this turned out to be important in some parts, uh, some tools that are used. I mean, today it's called the Amaga method, and it's used in sort of some revision proof uh, of this, like third generation proof of the classification of finite simple proofs. So, but these were not inspired, these are not consequences of the result as much as the proof. But just suffice to say that this is a very important result, both the proof uh, and the result. So, when you have such a great result, what do you want to do? Of course, as a mathematician, you want to generalize it or like try to push it, see where it goes. So let's read it again. Three valent GR transitive graph. That's the hypothesis. So where could we go from there? Well, to my mind, the two most obvious things to relax in the hypothesis are the three valent and the GR transitive, right? Like how to relax it. So let's start with the valency, right? Suppose we say, okay, three valent, what about four valent? That's the obvious next thing. So um, actually I have a picture here. So let me see how this goes. So this is, this is a family of graphs called the read graph. Okay, so I, it has, it's a one parameter family. I, I hope you can see I've got these sort of little dots. So it's a four valent graph. I hope you can see these are vertices. And they come in pairs, basically, that are, and they're all adjacent. You know, you have a pair and it's adjacent to the next, the two pairs on the side. The sort of global structure of the graph is kind of like a cycle. You've got a cycle, it's actually a lexical graphic product of a cycle with just two vertices. Um, and it's just graph on two vertices. Yeah. Gabriel, are you saying you're showing the graph already? Yeah. Oh, you can't see it? It doesn't come up on my screen. Maybe you've only shared the PDF viewer. Uh, can anybody see the graph? Nobody else. Uh, right. Okay, how do I, oh, that's a bit strange. Uh, uh, I do believe that you're sharing the application window. Of your, okay, of and how do I do that? Sorry, I'm still like, uh, I have no idea what to. Uh, does anybody know how do I, like, so that you see everything I see on my screen? Uh, like, as so I'm seeing it. You go at share screen. Yeah. So, 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 uh, so you might have to stop sharing and then start okay. sharing again. But instead of picking up the application window, you might you just pick the desktop, and then it will show exactly what is but, on your. But screen. how do I choose that option? I don't see. I see advanced sharing option. It's not even there. One multiple. Who can share? Um, hmm. if, you, if you only click the green button. Oh, I see. Okay, I, I've just seen a way to 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 do it. Okay, one second. I'll have to redo it every time. Okay, I can see it. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, I'll just stop share and reshare it every time. Okay, and choose the window. Okay, so here's the graph. So, okay, now you can see it. So it's four valent. It's a product of a cycle. So there's a parameter. It's the sort of leg of the cycle. Imagine keep, it keeps going in a cycle. And then you've got two vertices. It's four valent. That's sort of obvious. It's connected and so on. And it's not very hard to let's see that's arc transitive. In fact, let's look at some of the automorphism. The, the main point is that if you take two of these sort of twin vertices that have the same neighborhood, you can swap them. Right, I guess I can use an actual brush like these two. You could swap these two, right, with an automorphism and fix everything in the graph. Right? And you can do that everywhere. And you've got some other automorphism to make sure you're arc transitive. You've got sort of cyclic rotation and this reflection and so on. But okay, so that's enough to show transitivity. But the big point is that because of this, um, these little 
sort of local automorphism that fix most of the graphs, you get a huge automorphism group, right? You get, you know, if you have two n vertices, like suppose you have two n vertices, then you get at least like two to the n automorphism, right? Just by sort of all these swaps that you can do independently. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop sharing and go back to the, uh, sorry, I know this is not the best way. But... Okay, um, so, okay, let's see. This graph had say two m vertices. In fact, the size of the group is roughly the size. The, but the main point is that it's roughly exponential in the number of um, vertices. It's at least exponential, which is really bad. I mean, from the point of view, suppose we were trying to mimic Tuff's theorem, not only Tuff's theorem fails, right? The stabilizer is unbounded, but it's very, very unbounded, if you allow me this expression. Like it, it grows exponentially with the number of vertices. So if somebody like Marston would come along uh, and say, okay, I'm going to try and use the same method, it would fail miserably. It would get to maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50 vertices, and then the computer would crash because the groups get too big too quickly. So, and for many other applications, this is, this is bad. Okay, so Tuff's theorem doesn't hold. Stabilizer can be really big. Okay, now I'm gonna show you another graph. So let's try to generalize a different way. Let's keep three valent, but drop our transitivity. Uh, oh yeah, here. Um, and go to say vertex transitivity, right? That's sort of a sort of the obvious case. And actually you've got a very similar example. It's almost the same. So again, you've got a sort of cyclic structure, but all the vertices come in a bunch of fours, right? I hope you can see that. So there's sort of four, four, and you kind of alternate. First you do like a kind of four cycle like this, and then a perfect matching. Four cycle, perfect matching. Four cycle, perfect matching. And you keep going. So now this is a three valent graph, right? I hope you can see this. And it's vertex transitive. It's not very hard to see. Let's look at some automorphisms. Well, first you've got the kind of cyclic rot rotation, but where you go forward by two, right? And then you've got kind of like these reflections here and here. Okay, that's that's fine. That's enough to show vertex transitivity already. Oh, well, you've got kind of like a reflection here. But actually, more importantly, I hope you can still see it in the fact check. Now you can do a double transposition, not a single transposition like before. But now if I swap those two and those two simultaneously and fix everything else, I hope you can see this is an automorphism. And so similarly as before, you can do all of that independently. And basically, you again get an exponential not as big as before, but still exponential. I'm just going to go back to the slides. Uh, okay, so if you drop three valent and say go to four valent, things fail miserably. If you drop arc transitive and go to say vertex transitive, things fail miserably again. Uh, if anything, that should give you even more respect for that theorem, right? Not only it's such a useful and strong theorem, but it's like, I don't want to say it's isolated because it's not true, and that'll be part of the point of the rest of the talk. But it's the hypothesis that's there is important, right? You change three valent to four valent doesn't work. You change our transitive to vertex transitive doesn't work. So these things are important to play a role. And so then you ask yourself, okay, so what is actually important? Can you actually get some kind of analog of, of Tut's theorem? Like where do you have to go? If this doesn't work, what can you do? And this is where you start thinking about local action. I know some of you know this, but let's go through this slowly. So what is local action? Um, so you've got a graph, it's G vertex transitive, so you've got a group acting transitively on vertices. Let's, since it's transitive, it's regular, let's give a name to the valency, call it K. Pick a vertex, V. Give a name to the neighborhood. So I'm gonna call gamma V, that's the neighborhood. So those are the, the vertices that are adjacent to V. And then, um, this is the key now. So you take the stabilizer, the, the group fixing that vertex, and you look at it's the permutation induced on the, on the, on the neighborhood. Oh, the group might be very big, but this is like a small group, right? It's a permutation group groups. It's induced action. In other words, this is a subgroup of sim k, right? It's acting only on the k neighbors. I will actually look at an example uh, soon enough. Some people call this the local group. Some people call it the local. I mean, there's many different things you could call it. It's the permutation group of degree k, and up to permutation equivalence, it does not depend on the choice of vertices, right? Because if you map it around, it's just sort of basically relabeling things. And now just a piece of notation, if it's permutation isomorphic to L, we're gonna see that the pair gamma G is locally L. Um, let's do actually two very quick examples. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna go back to the two examples we already saw. Sorry, I gotta start sharing again. Um, we're just gonna do the uh, two examples and very and quickly look at what the local action is. What is the local action in this one? Maybe I use a different color. So I look at, well, oh, that didn't work. Look at this vertex, okay? And it, here are its four neighbors, four. If I fix this vertex, basically I'm asking, what can I do to the four neighbors? Well, I can swap these two and fix the other two. I can swap these two and fix the other two independently. And I can also like, do a reflection here and swap the two blocks, right? I can interchange the two blocks. And that's it. 
I can't do anything else. So that's the dihedral group. I mean, it's a read product, C2 times uh, read C2, or it's the dihedral group of order eight, which I'll denote D4 for now, whatever you want to call it. It's a group of order eight. That's what you can do. That those are the only things you can do on the neighbors. So you don't get the full symmetric group, right? You have these two blocks that are preserved, and you can do whatever you want while preserving these blocks. Okay, that's the, the, the example. So that would be the local action in this case. It would be the dihedral. And that's important. You'll see it'll come up. It'll come back later. Let's do the other one, the sort of prevalent um, vertex transit graph. Okay, let's pick a vertex. Uh, I don't know, this one, and look at its three neighbors. Now, what can we do? If I fix this vertex, this vertex fixed. What can I do? You might notice immediately, in fact, that this vertex is fixed. Once you fix this vertex, this one is fixed. Uh, when we see this is, for example, these edges are in a four cycle, but these edges are not in a four cycle. If I fix this, this edge must be fixed, and so, in fact, this vertex is fixed. But I can still swap those two, right, with the supermotion that was already there. So, in this case, the local action is C2 in, on three points. Right, it's the transposition one two as a subgroup of sim three. That's what it is. I mean, so it's a group of order two inside sim three. That's what it is. So that's the local action. So these are sort of two um, easy examples. So the local action tells you um, once you fix a vertex, what can you do? Which kind of automorphism? Global automorphisms, but you only look at their local action on the on the neighbors. Okay, and now basically we want to know. It turns, I'm sort of, I guess by giving this definition, it's sort of foreshadowing, but it turns out that the local action is what's important for results similar to Tut's theorem. So let's give the definition. If I have a particular permutation group, I'm gonna call it graph restrictive, so the permutation group is L. If there is a constant, such that for every pair, locally L pair, the establisher is bounded by a constant, right? Uh, so in other words, yeah, a uh, permutation group will be called graph restrictive if whenever that you, if, if that's the local action, the like for all the graphs that have the local action, um, the stabilizer is always bounded by constant. Even though the graphs might get really big, the stabilizer is, is small. Exactly like in Tut's theorem. Um, let me, let's do a very, actually, sorry, let me skip, let me get, go to this first. So Tut's result is more or less saying that S3, the group S3 and its natural action on three points is graph restricted. That's sort of the essential content. Okay, it's telling you more, it's telling you what the constant is and so on. But basically it's saying, if the local action is S3, then um, the stabilizer is small, which is not obvious, right? You shouldn't sort of just, that result it needs a proof. Um, here's an easy result, just to make sure that we understand. I'll, I'll, I'll try to give this proof very quickly. So if a group is, sim a permutation group is semi-regular, by the way, what semi-regular mean? Some people call this free, some people call this fixed point free. It just means all the point stabilizers are trivial. Okay, so these are all synonyms. Um, a semi-regular group is graph restrictive. Let's just do this proof because it's basically like two lines and it might help you to understand to make sure that you've got everything so far. So sorry, I'm sharing to get my picture, which is this one. Um, okay, so here's a little picture of part of a graph. So it's a local picture. And uh, so it's not the whole graph. Okay, it's a five villain graph and I'm only drawing a little part. And I'm going to assume that L is semi-regular. So the local action, sorry, it's very hard to write with my mouse like this. And what I'm going to show, I'm going to show that an arc stabilizer is trivial. Okay, so this, uh, here's an arc. I'm going to show that if you fix this vertex and also this neighboring vertex, then everything is fixed under this hypothesis that the local action is semi-regular. It's very easy. It's a one-line proof, basically, or well, two-line, whatever. So let's have a look. So I'm taking an automorphism that fixes these two things, and I want to show it's trivial. Well, let's see. What could it possibly do? Let's look around this vertex. Around this vertex, let's look at the neighbors. Okay. Well, around the neighbors, I'm already fixing one of them, right, of the neighbors. Inside the vertex stabilizer, I'm fixing one of the neighbors. But we just agreed that the local action was semi-regular. And semi-regular means all the point stabilizers are trivial. Therefore, if I fix this vertex, I'm inside one of the point stabilizers, therefore I'm trivial. Therefore, I must fix all the neighbors. And then that's it. You just use connectedness, right? We prove that we, if you fix an arc, you fix all the adjacent vertices, but then same argument fixes this. And then using you connectedness, you fix everything. And so your automorphism is trivial. So it's a, it's a very short one. It's trivial, this result. The fact that the, a semi-regular semi group is um, graph restrictive. In other words, if the local action is semi-regular, the stabilizer has to be very small. In fact, it, yeah, it has, it's at most the order of the, the it's the most available. So that's very easy. But this is not trivial. This is not the result. Um, and so in a sense, the question becomes, uh, what are the graph restrictive groups? 
So just to give you an idea, so people have been working on this for a while, trying to bound the size of the vertex stabilizer. We didn't use this language, by the way. So I, I introduced this word, but people were proving this kind of result uh, for a long time, but they were just using longer sentences. They would say, if this is the local action, then the stabilizer is bounded by this constant and so on. For example, Tony Gardner in the 70s proved that A4 and S4 are graph restrictive. And that's actually enough to, as a corollary, you get that in four valent or transitive case, B4, the dihedral group, is the only problem. Because uh, there's only five transitive groups of S4. There's S4 and A4. The other two are, are semi-regular, or regular, in fact. So D4 is the only problem, which I hope you think connects back to the read graph example, right? The read graph, the first graph I showed you, was a four valent or transitive graph. Um, and we looked and we computed the local action, and it was D4. But now we could have predicted this. If the stabilizer is big, it has to be locally D4. So locally D4 graphs in the four valent or transitive case are the only ones that can have large stabilizer. So I hope you see why the local action is, is important, right? Now you have this result. If you're, if you're interested for some reason in four valent or transitive graphs, the only ones that can cause a problem from the perspective of the vertex stabilizers are the locally D4 one. And you see even those ones, you can do something. But this shows you that the local action controls a lot of things. Okay, and this was the main conjecture in this area for a long time. So Richard Weiss, who works in a sort of a lot of, you know, he works in buildings and a bunch of stuff, but so he was working this kind of stuff um, in the 70s and the 80s. And he noticed that it seemed that whenever the group, the local action was primitive, in most cases, it looked like you could prove, you could bound the stabilizer or, or vice versa, maybe. Maybe notice that in many imprimitive cases, that many of the problem cases were imprimitive. So just a reminder for those that, uh, don't work with us a lot. A primitive group, right? A permutation group is a transitive group, but it preserves no non-trivial partitions, right? The partition, not the trivial partitions are the one into singletons, and the one where you have a unique part. So every group preserves those trivially. And a group is primitive um, if those are the only ones it preserves. So that was a big conjecture. And I just want to say, I might as well say it right now, it's still open. Although there's been much progress since those days, but uh, so more and more cases have been done, but it's still open. Um, so here are some examples of what's known. Uh, so I think this case was, pro I forget, sorry. So, but the two kinds of cases were definitely finished by Trofimov. It was on three, let me, did, would Weiss have done? I think even the case of prime degree. So Weiss did a lot of progress on this result, but these two cases were um, finished by Trofimov in the early 2000s. So, so just to give you an example, transitive groups of prime degree are graph restrictive. If you go back to what that originally means, that actually, that's a generalization of Tuft's result. Tut's result is the case where this prime is three here. In other words, three, Tut's result worked for three. Four didn't work, but that's partly because four was not a prime. If you take a arc transitive graph of prime degree, then again, the stabilizer is bounded, just like in Tut's result. But that's much harder. So this is this is this part of the result. So the Tut's result worked because three is a prime in some sense. Um, okay, and, and if you want to inter interpret this graph theory, you see that two arc transitive groups, uh, graphs have bounded stabilizers in terms of the degree. Um, so this is still open in general. Um, so, and then people sort of started slowly to look at, okay, um, for example, Cheryl at some point, uh, conjectured that quasi-primitive groups are also graph restricted. So this is, this is a generalization. It's a wider class of primitive groups. Um, I'm not gonna give the definition because I'm not gonna use it. And I'm gonna skip straight to semi-primitive semi groups. So, I started looking at this problem actually a while ago now, almost about 10 years ago, and I asked myself, well, what is really the class of graph restrictive? Like, can we, rather than just have a single direction, can we characterize them? And we came up with this conjecture, which is still a conjecture. So PSV there is, is pretty much proportional to Pablo Spiga and I. And let me just uh, show a little bit more. So we think, this is still a conjecture, that the class of graph restrictive is exactly the class of semi primitive which is even more general. So first, let me give you the definition. A group, a prim permutation group is semi-primitive if every normal subgroup is either transitive or semi-regular. All right. This might seem a bit, okay, it's quite a short definition. It's not that long, but it still seems a bit um, peculiar, maybe arbitrary the first time you see it. Let me give you a, a very, very, very natural example. Actually, I've seen mathematicians say that, not in the context of semi-primitive groups, that this is the most natural example of a group action that you can ever, even look at. This is the most important group action in all of mathematics. I've actually heard some people say that. Just take a vector space and then take the general linear group on the vector space. 
remove zero because of course zero is fixed. And then GLV acts on the rest of the vector space and it acts transitively. And typically there's a few exceptions, but I, but okay, let's say it's, I don't know, finite vector space or at least finite dimensional. And I think then it works. Um, apart from very few exceptions, there, this GLV here has very, very few normal subgroups. Probably most of you have seen this at some point, right? The normal subgroups more or less come in two classes. Either they're very big and typically contain SLV, or they're very small and they're contained in the center, right? And they're basically like scalar uh, matrices. These are the only, has very few normal subgroups. It's, it's not a simple group, but it's sort of close-ish. It has very few normal subgroups. And the groups that contain SLV are transitive on the vectors. And the groups that are contained in the center, they're not transitive and they're, they're semi-regular though. Uh, that's very easy to show. So this is an example, this group, is semi-primitive, but it's not primitive or it's not quasi-primitive typically. So this is, this is a good example to show, I mean, I don't want to get too much into the talk about the structure of semi-primitive groups. In fact, if you want to know more about this, we've got two people in the audience, Michael and Luke, who are experts on this. Um, but it, I just wanted to give you an example to show sort of the group that's in this class, but is not in any of the sort of more restricted natural classes. And it's, and I really want to, like, it's a very fundamental example. So, I mean, these are, some of these groups are very important. Just the general inner group acting on vectors. Um, one of the most basic groups in mathematics. Um, and I really want to say, we didn't just come up with this conjecture arbitrarily. We sort of thought of the most general way we could prove non graph restrictiveness. So in fact, we actually proved half of this conjecture. We proved that graph restrictive groups have to be semi-primitive. And actually, philosophically, I think more of the, con the, the contrapositive. Basically, if a group is not semi-primitive, if it's got a normal subgroup that's not transitive or not semi-regular, then we can use that somehow to find examples of graphs with large stabilizers. So the only ones that can be graph restrictive are the semi-primitive groups. So this is our, and I guess you could say this is a conjecture through like failure of imagination on our part. Like these are the ones that we were able to do. And then we're like, oh, well, you can't think of anything else. So this must be the right answer, basically. Um, if you're a little bit mean, I guess you could say that. Although it's not, there is some evidence for the other direction. And a lot of people have been, have sort of started working on other direction. And it's surprising. Many results that people used to prove on sort of I, assuming primitivity or assuming quasi primitivity are now assuming semi primitivity. And in fact, Stefan Permi, who's in the audience, is one example of this, right? His recent paper. Many of this hypothesis is assume that it's locally semi primitive. There's no reason in assuming anything stronger. In many of the cases that they're interested in, because essentially of this result, like when the results would fail if it's not semi-primitive. And it turns out that many of the things you actually want to prove, it works for semi-primitive. So there's sort of good evidence that uh, this is sort of the right answer. But of course, it's still open. And I just want to make a small interesting comment. Um, we came up with sort of the condition, like graph restrictive if and only if something, but we didn't actually come up with the name. Um, apparently, this also came up and some stuff that I'm super not familiar with that I could not tell you about, but something about universal algebra. Some other people were just in a completely different problem that I understand nothing about. And they were interested in something and they also came up with, I think conjecture as well, or maybe theorem that blah, 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 blah happens if and only if the group is semi-primitive. And then they, they define this, this, I mean, they, they found this name to this property. So we, it's surprising. We came up with, like we ended up with the same property for a completely unrelated problem. And so we reused their word their, their terminology, because I actually think it's, it's quite a good choice. All right, let's uh, move on from this. I just want to make a very small comment before, so this is almost the end of the first half. Um, just the last slide, a small comment. Suppose you have a group that's not graph restrictive, like before, right? We saw the read graphs earlier. And then you might say, okay, the, group, the, graphs can, the groups can be really big, it's hopeless, but it's not completely true. I just want to say graph restrictive is not the end of everything. Um, for example, here's a result that we proved a little while ago using completely different techniques. And in a sense, it has nothing to do with graph restrictive. In fact, it's showing that it's, you can, there's other things you can do. It's basically saying, if you have a four valent transitive graph, you have three cases. This case, just think of it as a read graph. I don't know if it's a read graph. Actually, they're, oh, sorry. Um, they're not necessarily read graphs. They're like graphs similar to read graphs. So I think the graph is a, similar to a read graph or there's finitely many exceptions. And we can actually list them. We have a list of the exceptions. Or, okay, this is some weird formula, but just think of it as the stabilizer is really small. If you look at it, like the stabilizer is really, really small. Actually, it grows uh, sublinearly, less than linear with respect to the number of vertices. Okay, so this is almost as good as Stats theorem. 
So you know, earlier I said Todd's theorem fails miserably for four valent Arkansas graph. I was lying a little. I wasn't lying. It does fail miserably. But in fact, there's only one family that's really bad. It's read graphs and their cousins. If you remove the read, the read graphs and their cousins are exponential, but then everything else is fine, which actually is is okay for most of the applications. Actually, so this result it's fundamentally it's very different from Todd's result because there, you have these exceptions, but you understand them, and so you can actually recover pretty much everything. So either the graph is known or GV is still kind of small. Not as small as before, but still pretty small. And so then you can recover uh, very similar things as you were able to do for Todd. You can still get a, all the graphs up to a certain order if you want. Uh, you can still bound the asymptotics and get something like n to the log n for the number of subgraphs and so on and so on. So I'm not, I just want to say, even if it's not graph restrictive, there's still things you can do. All right, since this is sort of the natural halfway point, I want to say, ask if there's any questions. On this so far. All right. Okay. Well, I have one question that yeah. is more about terminology. Like yeah, those, go ahead. The bunch of a uh, uh, bunch of the finite uh, finite set of uh, examples. Yeah. You mentioned there. Is any of them called a monster? No. No, no. They're 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 very they're small and they're not. Uh, yeah. No, they're not. They're not like sprite. I don't want to get too much into this, but they're not that interesting. Let me just put it this way. Okay. <laughs> um, it's yeah. It, they're not they're not related to like exceptional structures or anything. They just happen to be very small, and so that's it. Like they're very small. They're 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 not yet. They don't sort of kick in. They 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 squeeze under the formula is basically just one way to put it. Okay. Now I'm going to talk to you about something related. Well, basically, I'm going to ask. Okay, how? Suppose I'm interested now in digraphs. So now my graphs will have like a direction. How do I generalize this? Can we generalize any of this? And it's, I'm not gonna have so many answers now. I mean, in the first half I had some answers, some questions, but it's gonna be mostly questions. Like, uh, um, so first of all, I, I should point out what do I mean by digraph? So it's basically this, one way to think about it is just a binary, binary relation on the set. Uh, and you, uh, you know, if, you, if U is related to V, then you put an arc from U to V but it's not necessarily symmetric. So a graph would be the case where the direction is symmetric. Okay, you, in this case, you this technically allows loops and whatever, but honestly, for most of the cases I'll be interested in, it doesn't really make a difference. But so it's just a binary relation and you draw it in sort of the usual way. I'll actually have the picture quite soon. And then all the obvious stuff and automorphism uh, is a permutation of diversities that preserve the relation. And the, the relation we, you think of it as the arc set, so you're arc transitive if the group uh, preserves the arc set. And again, under very mild hypothesis, which I don't want to get into, if you assume something like arc transitivity or anyway, something similar, then a, a digraph is either a graph, like it really is a graph, it's undirected, or a proper digraph, by which I mean, if you have an arc in one direction, you don't have an arc in the other direction. I'll, I'll have a picture very soon. Okay, here's the, main, the big basic question that I'm interested in for now, for, the, for a little bit. How do you even define local action? So I told you what local action was for graphs. How do you define local actions for digraphs? You might say, well, just do it. I mean, just define it. But let me show you a picture and explain what I mean. There's, there's multiple ways. There's, a, there's at least, I can think of four different ways that are different, but all generalize uh, the notion of local action in the graph. So let's have a look. This is a digraph, well, a, a local picture. So it's got alt valency four and valency four. So this is my the sort of central vertex I'm interested in. These I would call the alt neighbors, the in neighbors. Okay, what's the local action? I'll tell you right away the like four things that I could come up with. So obviously we have a group G, and then this is V, and I have to stop as a GB. I mean, that's sort of obvious, right? They start with GB. But then what action do you look at? You could look at the action of GB on the out neighbors, right? That would be one local action. Actually, I'm gonna call it the out local action. You could look at the in local action, the uh, action on the in neighbors. And actually, spoiler alert, you might think, well, what's the difference? Even when the graph is arc transitive, you'll see, even when it's arc transitive, so this arc can be mapped to this arc, these are not necessarily the same. So that's a different one. You could look at the pair, right? You, I mean, you could look at each of them individually. You could look at the pair in local action, out local action, as a sort of the data that you're interested in. And finally, you could look at something, I don't know if you have a name for it, the total local action, which would be the action on all the vertices, all of these at the same time, right? Which would probably be intransitive, but still. And that's the strongest one, by the way. If you, if you take the last one, you can recover the other ones. But anyway, look, I don't want to answer this question. I'm just saying these are four different ways you could define the local action in a digraph. And they all, like, if you specialize their graph, they all become the usual local action. So they're all different things that all properly generalize the local action. 
Okay, so, and I don't, I don't really have an answer at this point because I don't know enough about digraphs yet to tell you, look, this is the one you should be looking at. But I will tell you one thing that like, I've been thinking a little about this that I find very interesting. Okay, so, okay, from the picture, we define the in neighborhood in the obvious way and the in local action in the obvious way. So that's the action on the in neighbors of the vertex, out local action, out neighborhood, the action of the stabilizer on the out neighbors. Okay, and again, this is not obvious. I really want to emphasize, I know some people that have been working in this area with graphs for a long time, that the first time they see this, even in an R transitive graph, these things are not necessarily permutation isomorphic. They're not even, they don't even necessarily have the same order and so on. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, soon. Um, but okay, here's some things you can prove. So what's the relationship? I'm not really interested in the relationship between the in-local action and the out-local action. I told you they're not the same, but like, what can you say about them? First of all, they have the same degree. This relies heavily on finiteness, by the way. It's just a, a weird way of saying that the, the in valency is the same out the out valency, which is true in the finite case, just by a simple count. Okay, so it's a more complicated way of saying the same thing. They have the same number of orbits. That's also a, a simple counting argument. They have the same simple sections. In other words, the simple groups that sort of appear in them have to be the same. And also, this, all of this depends quite heavily on finiteness here. All of this would fail in the infinite. Um, in particular, some consequences of this last thing, they have the same div prime divisor. So the orders can be different, but not too different. And if one is soluble, then the other is. So I want to emphasize, they can be different, but not too different, right? They're not completely random. They're, they're like cousins. They're related, but they don't have to be the same. And actually, my main question is, so I'm going to give the proper definition on the next slide, but I can tell you right away. My question is, what is the relationship between L plus and L minus? If I tell you L plus, for example, can you give me the complete list of all the possible N minus? If I know the local action, what can I know about the old local action? This says you can know some stuff, but I don't know. Like, yeah, that's basically the question. So I'm going to give, I like giving, I like definition. So I'm going to give a name to this. If I have two permutation groups, I'm going to call them compatible if I can find. So this is an important definition. A finite G vertex transitive digraph. Okay, so that so that the low in local action is L minus, and out local action is L plus. Does that make sense? So two permutation groups are compatible if they can arise as the in and out local action in some digraph. So some permutation groups are compatible, some are not, right? And and sort of for example, this lemma at the bottom there of the slide gives you some uh, necessary conditions basically for compatible groups. Okay. So the problem that I'm interested in that I'll talk about for the rest of the talk is which permutation groups are compatible. What do we know? Which is not much, actually. I don't know much, but I think it's a very, very fascinating question. And I'm going to try and convince you of that. I'll tell you a bit about what I know, but I'll try and show you some examples why it's so interesting, in my opinion. So when you say sim they have the same simple sections, is that yeah. like with the same multiplicity in a given composition uh, series? No, it's not the same multiplicity. And it's not right. even the same composition series. I'm really saying simple section. I'll give you an example later where they have different uh, composition factors. Mm -hmm. So they have the same simple sections, but not the same composition factors necessarily. It's a very weak uh, statement. I'll give you an example uh, on the next slide after this one. So, so it, I think it's probably of simple section then? Uh, a, a simple section, you take, um, you, it's, a, it's a quotient of a sub, basically a simple section is the, the loosest thing you can do by taking quotients and subgroups repeatedly. Okay. So it's a, it's a quotient of a subgroup. If inside somewhere you can find a subgroup and then quotient that, that's called, a, well, that's a section in general. And if it's simple, then it's a simple section. Okay. It's, it's like, if you can, it's the, loo, it's the, I think it's the loosest way you can think of a subgroup as a group being inside another group, more or less, right? Like, for example, A5 is a simple section in A6, right? It's there, or, or it's a simple, anyway, I'll give an example, which, which might help to clarify, but the, the definition, it's a, it's a quotient of a subgroup. Mm -hmm. That's a section. Okay. And if it's simple, then it's simple. simple. Okay, I'm gonna focus on transitive groups. So remember, they have the same number of orbits. So if one is transitive, the other is transitive. Okay, I wanna say right now, I'm gonna make a lot of assumptions now because this one is so hard. I'm gonna make a bunch of assumptions and it'll still be too hard anyway. But okay, at least it'll be a little bit easier. So I'm gonna assume things are transitive, which is the same as assuming the graph is R transitive. Okay, that's uh, the digraph is R transitive. So that's equivalent. So I'm gonna make things a little bit easier for myself for now. By the way, I've been working on this recently with some people that are actually in this, in this talk. But this was studied a lot for some reason uh, in the 80s, for example, by people like Peter Cameron and so on. They proved some results, which I'll show you very quickly. They used a different language though. They didn't use digraphs. They used the language of transitive constituents, but it's exactly the same. And then there was a huge break. Nobody worked on it for 20 years. I'm not sure why, but anyway, so we started working on it recently again. So 
So here are some results, things that you can prove. Uh, so, so these are previous results, these are old results. Uh, if they're grouped or compatible, they have a common non-trivial homomorphic image. So you can, so this shows again that they're somehow related a little bit. So you can prove some stuff. Uh, if one of them is too transitive as prime degree, then the other one has to be permutation equivalent. So you see, so this is an example where if one of them is like this, the other one has to be exactly the same. And if both are quasi primitive, then one is a quotient of the other. Uh, this is new to clap. Here's, this is not a, a hard result, okay? I wouldn't call it a lemma. It's not too hard, it's, it's, but it is very, very important. So this is an if and only if. So two transitive groups are compatible. And I don't know it's very long, uh, but I'll, I'll try to do it in the picture again earlier. And one direction is very easy, and I'll, I'll show you the proof of that one direction. So, but it gives you a criteria because it's if and only if. So we actually kind of forget about the definition, and from now on, we'll just use this as a sort of essentially the definition. Okay, so let's let's read it because this is easier. It says two groups are compatible if there exists a finite group with two isomorphic subgroups, and then the permutation group induced by the big group on each of the two subgroups that are isomorphic should be on the call sets, should be the two uh, L plus and minus that you were given. Let's try to do one direction. Uh, one direction is the forward, the direction that's easy is the forward direction. Basically, you should think of H as the vertex stabilizer. Let, let me go back. If I go to the picture, you should think of H as the vertex stabilizer and this as the, and these two as the arc stabilizers. This is the arc stabilizer of like an in arc and this is an arc stabilizer of an out arc. And then let's, let's check. Let's check to get to the forward direction. Okay, so there's a stabilizer, two isomorphic subgroups. Of course, they're isomorphic because the two the graph is arc transitive, so you can map one arc to the other. So in fact, in the actual case, they're conjugate. They should be conjugate, and then everything just follows. Like uh, the, the local action is in fact the action of the stabilizer on the coefficients of the arc stabilizer because it's transitive. Right? If I sort of very quickly try to go to the, the picture that we have before. Um, if I look at GV and sort of uh, I look at this arc, right? If I'm if the GV acts transitively on these things, then the action on GV, the local action, is basically just the action of GV. Let's call this W on sort of GVW, right? And if I call this U, and then I have a GUV, right? the A local action is just the action of GV on the cosets of GUV. And, and I can map the arc UV to VU. So these two groups are not only isomorphic, they're actually conjugate, but in G, they're conjugate in G, not in GV. In GV, you don't know, but they're still isomorphic because they're conjugate in something, right? Okay. Um, so, but this is very nice because if you think about it, we got rid of the graph, right? In the definition of compatible, there was a graph. We got rid of the graph, not only that, we got rid of the big group. The big group G is gone. The biggest group that we have to deal with is H, which we just saw plays the role of the stabilizer. So this is basically saying, um, as long as you can make things work in the stabilizer, um, you're fine. Okay, so here's the example that I promised, just to show you sort of what can happen. Let's use this term. Take A, a means L twin group, take A5 times A6, and then take these two different subgroups. Take this copy of A5, and then take a copy of A5 inside A6, right? These are isomorphic, right? They're both A5. But then if you look at the action of A5 times A6 on each of the copies, well, okay, I don't know if you know how to do this, but basically you compute the core, so this one is normal, but this one is not normal, right? This one is core free. And so in fact, if you look at the act, the induced action, uh, one of them, you will just get A6, and the other one, you'll get A5 times A6. This means that there actually exists a digraph, an arc transitive digraph with this stabilizer, A5 times A6. Uh, the arc stabilizer is isomorphic to this, and the local actions on the out neighbors looks like this, and this one looks like this. And you see they have different orders, different composition factors. For example, A5, so for Colin's question, for example, A5 appears, here as a composition factor, but not there. So they can be substantially different. Okay, so this is an example. And this theorem says, yes, you will be able to find a digraph where this happens, okay? Um, okay, and now I said I'm gonna add assumption. I'm gonna add one more assumption, which this one is, I completely agree, uh, be honest, it's not really justified. It's just, let's try to make things easier. Okay, super easy. Let's, these transit groups, let's make them regular. Okay, regular groups. And now this com condition becomes so simple, okay? Mm. This is the condition. And this is something that you could explain in like second or third, as soon as you explain what quotient is in your first class in group theory. You, so if you've been lost up to now, I think it's a good time to come back because it's just so easy. This is the difference I'm interested in. There is, ex I'm given two groups, okay? L minus and L plus, that's the input. And I wanna know, is there a finite group H with two isomorphic normal subgroup, H minus and H plus, where the quotients are the, the given respective groups. That's it. That's what it becomes. And I want to know when can this happen? 
And this is such a basic question. You know, it's a basic mistake in, in first, first year uh, undergrads, right? They think, oh, if I take a group and poach it by two isomorphic normal subgroups, I should get isomorphic quotients. No, this is wrong. But how wrong is it? That's not my question. The groups can be different, but how different can they be? Let's have a very quick example again. Okay, start with this group. This is cyclic group, C8 times C4 times C2. And then I'm going to quotient by two isomorphic subgroups. I'm going to take C4 times C2, but first I'm going to take the C4 times C2. That's the obvious copy, this one, right? And then I'm going to take a C4 inside the C8 and a C2 inside the C4. Right? So these are both normal. I mean, the group is B and everything is normal. And then quotient, what do I get? This by this, this quotient, I get a C8, right? If I just kill off the C4 and the C2. But if I kill off the C4 and the C8, the C2 and the C4 and the 1 and 2, I get a C2 2. Right? So I took my group, I quotiented it out by two isomorphic normal subgroups, and I got these two different groups. So this little example is a proof that C8 is isomorph is compatible with C2 2. Is everybody following me? Right? If I can find a, a single group, a finite group, quotient by two isomorphic normal subgroups, and I get two different groups. These two groups that I get at the end are compatible. That's my definition. It's very important, by the way, that things are finite here. Uh, I'm sure some people will ask, but if it's infinite, everything is compatible. It's very easy to show, so it's kind of boring. The concept sort of loses. Uh, it's, I don't know. So actually, it's very, it's an easy exercise for your undergrads. Every abelian group of the same order are compatible, right? Um, so I'm very interested by this question, which groups are compatible? It's such, again, it's a question that a first year undergrad can ask, um, but I don't know the answer and I'm, I'm super interested in this. I have an, an application in mind, right, to, to grasp, but even on its own, right, which groups can I get by quoting the finite groups by two isomorphic normal subgroups? Such a basic question. Um, let me skip over this. I, I'm supposed to finish at 55, right? Or what, ish? Or yeah, yeah, but we're not okay, going I'm, to I'm, I'm, um, okay, so I, I, I let me just go through this definition very quickly. So I have two subnormal series. So I have a group, a normal subgroup, and then a normal subgroup in there, a normal subgroup in there, and so on. So that's a subnormal series, and I have another one. And then I look at all the factors, right? The the quotients. I get a bunch of factors. If the, all, all the factors line up, so the quotient here is the same as the quotient there, quotient there, and so on, in the same order. So the series are the same length, the portions are all the same. I'm going to say these are compatible subnormal series, okay? And if the series are normal, which means every group is normal in the big group, then I'll call them compatible normal series. So this is a strengthening than the usual equivalence of, of between series, where I think you're allowed to permute the order of the portions. But here I want them to appear in the same order. So this is just a definition. Uh, there's a result of SIMS that says compatible groups have compatible subnormal series. And the proof, by the way, I'm not going to give it because I'm running a bit low of time, but it's, a, it's one page and it's all there. I, you don't read it. But the point is that it's easy. That's all I want to say. So it's an exercise. I mean, okay, if you've never seen it, it might take you a few minutes, but like, it's easy. So compatible groups have compatible subnormal series. So which is the reason for introducing this definition? So if your two groups are compatible, a necessary condition is you should be able to find composition series for them where all the factors appear in the same order, the, the quotient. Okay, so that's a, no, uh, um, and so is that an if and only if, right? You have a sort of necessary condition. Is it sufficient? Well, okay, if the series of length two, then you can reverse uh, the, the, the direction. So again, don't read the proof, but it's very easy. It's an easy exercise. In other words, if both of your groups are extend, like sync one, one step extension, like n dot h and n dot h, if both of them have the shape, then yes, they are compatible. But it's not true for length three, for example. Um, and actually it follows, for example, by sins, what we just saw that A4, the alternate group of the B4 has order 12, right? If you take the dihedral group of order 12, they're not compatible. It follows actually from this lemma because they don't have compatible subnormal series. A4 is a unique subnormal series, right? And the three is on, on the top, the, the, the factor of order three. And in, in the dihedral 12, you can never get the three on the top. So these are not uh, compatible. So this is an example. But actually, using this lemma, you can show that this abelian group, uh, C2 squared times C3, is compatible with both of them. So maybe it's surprising. I found that surprising the first time I see you. I saw it. Compatibility is not an equivalence relation. It's not transitive. It's not very interested in this I relation compatibility. So it's not a, a, an equivalence relation. It's not transitive, uh, which is maybe a little bit surprising. So I don't actually know what the answer is. I, I have a conjecture, which I'll show at the end, but it's a very, very work in progress. But in a sense, part of the problem is this basic issue. And so if I have a group, like, so I'm using Atlas notation here. So this means an extension like B, like you have a normal X as a normal subgroup B and the quotient size morphic to C. It's sort of sloppy notation, but it's sort of common. It's sort of shorthand. Suppose I have a group B dot C and a group A dot B. 
there might not be a group A dot B dot C. It's possible there is no such group. Uh, where sort of the extension here is this, oh, sorry. The extension is this one, and, and this thing is this thing. And here's an example. I mean, this is formally what I mean, because this is very sloppy notation. But um, for example, if you take the group, the Frobenius group over 21, C7 dot C3, and if you take S3, that's a C3 times C2, it's actually impossible to merge. You cannot get a C7, a C3, and a C2, so that this is a C7 and a C3, and this is a C3, C2. And that's a very easy proof. I'm not going to do it. But so you cannot always merge things. If you could do this merging, it would actually be very easy to solve the compatibility problem. But because of this issue, it's, it's hard. And I don't know the answer. And, and actually, this is my last slide. I'm just going to give you some sort of open problems and conjectures that, um, yeah. So here's the smallest example that I don't know. And I've been, I, this has been open in my mind, and I've been thinking about it for five, six years more. I've asked many people, I've had some people tell me proofs of this, and then once I read them carefully, they were wrong. So two very small groups of order 12. So if you haven't been listening, again, this part you can understand. I have A4, the alternate group of degree four, the cyclic group of order 12. And what is the question I'm asking? Can you find a finite group with two isomorphic normal subgroups of index 12? Both of them have index 12, they're both isomorphic, and one quotient is A4, and one quotient is C12. Either find an example or prove that there does not exist one. That's it. A very easy question about, you know, a finite group and two normal subgroups of index 12. I don't know the answer to this. It's just to show that I don't know much. There's many things we don't know about this. And it's such a natural question, right? Uh, you could ask it to your first year undergrad. You might not find the answer, but you could understand the question. Um, and I'm not just asking, like, for, oh, is that a question? I'm not just asking, like, because it's a small open case. I have reason to believe that if you solve this question one way or another, in the positive or negative, whatever technique you find will be applicable to many cases. I have, so it's not an, I, I'm giving this as a sort of easy to understand example, but it's not isolated. Um, and then here's my conjecture, and this is wild. It's not as strong, I would think, it doesn't have as much evidence as the one I had for graphs about semi primitivity, but it's my working conjecture. And I like that conjecture, it gives me something to aim for. Uh, and then I try to prove it or I try to disprove it. And then if it's wrong, I, I modify it and so on. But anyway, I have, I think that this might be true, that two groups are compatible if only you have, you have compatible normal series. So that's a stronger condition than SIMS, right? SIM was one direction and said compatible implies uh, compatible some normal series, but it's possible that this might be true. And it, I just want to say, I don't, I know many constructions to show that some groups are compatible. I showed you some, right? I showed the example with the abelian groups and so on. But I do not know a single method to show that two groups are not compatible except Sims's result. That's like a, you know, I, the proof was on the slide. I didn't go through it, but it's a, it's a tiny result with a six line proof that is the only way I can show two groups are not compatible. Unless it doesn't follow the hypothesis of Sims, unless they don't have compatible subnormal series, I do not know how to show they're not compatible. So this is just to show you my lack of knowledge. But by the way, it's not just me. This is such an easy question, like, you know, easy question. Again, it's a common mistake by undergrads, right? You take a subgroup, you quotient by two isomorphic normal subgroups. Sometimes they expect the quotients to be isomorphic. They are wrong, but the question is, how wrong are they? How different can two quotients be? They cannot be anything. You cannot, not all possibilities can occur. I'm asking which possibilities can occur, and we don't know. And I think this is a very fascinating question, and it's got connection to local actions and diagrams, perhaps surprisingly. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, are there any questions? <clears throat> Let me open the chat. Uh, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. Um, coming back to the graph restrictive stuff, uh, if I wanted to play around with this a little bit, what would be some of the easier examples of semi-primitive groups that are not yet known to be graph restrictive? Very good question. So I don't know if you still here, but the best person to answer this would be Luke Morgan, but I can try and do my best. Uh, I know that a few years ago, until about three, four years ago, the answer to that question would have been A4. Uh, wait, let me get that right. Um, no, is it? No, S4 on a transposition. Michael, am I getting that right? So S4 of degree 12 acting on the core sets of a transposition, for example. Yeah, I think so, yes. But, and uh, I think but, that might still be uh, open, but unless Luke has been working on some similar thing. So I don't know. On the, a few months ago, it would still have been open. Um, 
S4 acting on cosets of a transposition. So that's degree 12, right? Because it's index 12. Yeah. Um, and until a few months ago, that would still have been open, although that might not be the case of, of very recently. I, I uh, think Luke proved that. I thought he gave a talk to us in our seminar series about that. But yeah, okay. Well, how long ago was that, Michael? My book of talk notes is at home, unfortunately. No, so. no, but like, is it in the last few months or? Yeah, yeah, about two okay. or three months ago. Okay, so yeah, so that's like hot off the press or whatever, but. Uh, right. Um, yeah, I think, Michael, what would be the best place to find like more? Uh, um, uh, so I think still your original paper had a list of open. Yeah, so, but some of them, it's a bit, it's a I bit out of date off. now. Um, yeah. There's the paper with myself and Luke where we knocked off um, C3 squared yeah. C2. And that probably, in that paper, we probably surveyed what was still the smallest unknown. It, that's a very good question, Stefan. It, mm -hmm. It's hard to answer because it's sort of shifting every couple of years. Yeah, but, okay, um, okay. yeah, if you look at the latest papers by, say, Michael and, and Luke, they'll like, often have a list of like this, the three or four smallest, and often the smallest are sort of like a, you know, good, good places to start. Yeah, um, I agree. Okay, cool. I'll have a look. So this one is interesting, by the way. If I can make one more comment, it, it has the problem. Like A4 is regular in that case, right? So it's got a sort of regular subgroup. Um, yeah, it's a semi direct product with this sort of sub -light. You've got this, this uh, normal regular complement. So it's, it's sort of a, a special family, but even something like that is not that easy. Yeah. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions for Gabriel? Gabriel, I have a question. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can you hey, how are you doing, Gion? Yours? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Hi. Uh, so. Sorry. What's your question, Gion? I think he may have some microphone issues. Well, his video froze as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or some connection problems. So maybe he can ask the question during the coffee break if the connection starts working again. Yeah. So do we have any other questions for Gabriel? Um, yeah, I had a question. So this conjecture at the end, um, yeah. uh, two groups compatible if and only if they have compatible normal series. So you mm -hmm. could, you could make the compatibility more restrictive by also asking for the automorphisms that um, the group induces on the normal factor be the same. Um, and this um, is something you can do, for instance, with chief series, um, that you, you always get the same chief, chief factors with automorphisms up to reordering. I think that um, might be too strong, mm -hmm. Colin. I have, a, I have a feeling that, I, that uh, if you ask, so that's an even stronger condition, right? And I think I could probably. Oh, you're saying, but then you try to prove it for those, or what? As like a. Or, or find a counterexample, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, no, okay. yeah. So maybe, yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So that's, that's a stronger condition, like a compatible chief series or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any, any other questions? Uh, actually, sorry, Colin. I think that's the same. Okay. Because if you have compatible chief series, the chief series are normal series. But if you have compatible normal series, you can always refine it to a chief series anyway. Um, so, no, but I'm, I'm thinking of a, a chief series where you also record what automorphisms are induced on each oh, chief factor. I see, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Um, so you like distinguish between central and non-central factors. Yeah, okay. And so yeah, so that would be different. Um, yeah, that would be strong. And it seems that Ye Yong is back, so you yeah. had a question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Gabriel. Can you turn your slide to page uh, 15? Yeah, one second. I'm still sharing. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, one second. Um, 15. About an example. Uh, the one with A5 and A6? No, yeah, that one. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering as if I suppose that the diagraph diagraph is a uh, relative, relative primitive. Very so primitive, yeah. Is this still possible on that uh, we can find a uh, uh, two x divided one is normal and the other is not. Okay, okay, wait. Okay. So you're saying add the extra hypothesis that the global action is vertex primitive. Yes. Okay, and then what was the question? 
So you see in, in this example, in yeah. L minus and L plus, L plus one is normal in H and then the other is not. Oh, I see, I see, I no, see. I see. Okay, uh, actually in this case, they're both normal. Uh, well, no, that's not true, sorry. One, one is equal and the other is a quotient. Oh, oh. You should be careful, it looks oh, I mean, normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, tec I mean, but technically it's a I quotient, mean, right? It's not a subgroup. I mean, it's H minus and H plus. Oh yeah, okay, is it the R subgroup? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, Good question. So you're saying the question is, can I find an ex a vertex primitive example where one yes. arc stabilizer is normal and the other isn't? Yeah. Like like in, like this example. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, I, I'm gonna take uh, it my guess. I'm gonna say yes is my guess, but I don't have an example offhand. Yeah, I tried to find such an example, but I failed. <laughs> okay, that's an interesting question. So, but yeah, you're adding a global hypothesis, right? And the whole point of this theorem yes. is that we got rid of mm -hmm. any global thing, right? It's only yeah global because, global. because this, this is a good question. Uh, because for the Antwerp case, uh, the axis derivative cannot be normal in right. The, um, do you theory. know, Michael? That's a question for you as well. Okay. Uh, sorry, but I he said, "Can you find a vertex primitive, say, arc transitive diagraph where uh, one arcs where the out the arc stabilizer is normal on one side but not the other?" So the arc stabilizer would be normal, say, in the in vertex, but not in the out vertex. That's equivalent to this question. You have to be faithful on that. Uh, R side is normal in GB, so GVW yeah. would be normal in GV. Yeah. Uh, anyway, look, we can do the think about it over the coffee break, but just so like because that's the kind of stuff that you're interested in as well. But then it would be regular on the out neighbors. Uh, yeah. So what? And then it doesn't have to be regular on the in neighbors. No. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And there is one more question in the comments. Oh, yeah, okay. Chat, and that is what is known in terms of uh, being okay. graphed. Yeah, I see, yeah. I see the question. Uh, is the person here, Fatima? I have a clarification. Uh, graph restrictive is about permutation groups, right? So when you say six as six, I'm assuming you mean in the natural action on six points, in which case I think they're, they're known to be uh, graph restrictive. And Michael can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's not. Yeah, it is. It is known. Actually, I do know. Yeah. So they, these are they are graph restrictive, and I'm actually the, the best constants are probably known as well. Off, off, I don't know them offhand, but uh, they, they should be in the literature. Actually, uh, the, in fact, for six value, yeah, the list of stabilizers are are listed. You can even get the whole structure of the vertex stabilizers in some paper. If you really want to know, email me, and I can send you a reference. Okay. So wouldn't this be uh, covered by Trofimov's theorem? Yes, about? exactly. For example, they're two transitive. But it yeah. probably was known before that. Okay. Uh, Trofimov, basically Weiss actually did almost all of two transitive, but he left open a sort of very hard case. And then Trofimov spent like eight papers finishing the last very hard case. But so most cases in the end, when you look them up, they're actually due to Weiss. But yeah, you're right. It is covered by the two transitive case. Well, I think we can close this up for now and any further questions we can leave for the coffee break. So thanks again, right. Gabriel, for the talk. It was really nice. Yeah. Thanks. Let's hit the reaction buttons. <laughs> we can stop recording. <laughs>